God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Unapologetic. I'm so excited because today we have a guest that I have wanted forever, just couldn't wait to have her. We have Sissy Graham Lynch with us today. Please help me welcome her to the show because this is going to be one for the books. Hi, Sissy. Hi. Thanks for having me today. It's really surreal. I've wanted you to be on the show forever because, of course, my show is unapologetic and your show is... Oh, fearless. A fearless, fearless. faith in a compromising <laughs> yeah. culture. Right. So it felt like very compatible in that. Um, but let's start out by asking, we always ask, what do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? You know, I think if we do things with grace and with truth, um, where we stand for truth, but we do it with grace and love, that there shouldn't be much that we apologize for. Um, we can look at the history of Christians and see where kind of, and especially in the American church, we did a lot of things with truth and not a lot of grace. Um, and then the pendulum swung and we do a lot of things with grace and not a lot of truth. And I almost think it's kind of swinging back a little bit. If you look in the last few years, Christians are starting to do stuff with not a lot of grace anymore. Mm -hmm. But I um, also would say one thing, whether Christians realize it or not, stop apologizing for the gospel. Um, and we see that in churches. We see that with um, even Christians. We we underestimate the power of the gospel, and that's where salvation is, that we want to water it down. We want to put some creative, our seven creative points to it, and we think, oh, if we talk about the blood of Jesus, that's going to be offensive. Well, it is offensive because it makes people come stop in their tracks and come face-to-face -face with their sins. And so we have to stop apologizing for the gospel from the pulpit um, and we need pastors to proclaim truth and keep it simple. So I told you before the start, I wanted to tell you, um, for those listening who do not know who Sissy is, she's amazing in her own right. And I do not like when people introduce me solely because of who I'm related to. But y'all have to know who Sissy's related to. OK, so her grandfather was probably the most famous evangelist in the world. <laughs> and his name is Billy Graham. Many, many thousands, millions have received the gospel, the message, salvation because of his efforts to go and spread the gospel th throughout the world. Her dad is Franklin Graham, who does all kinds of stuff, but with Samaritan's Prayers and um, different organizations that they have, the Billy Graham Evangelism Association, he has carried on that legacy. And now we have Sissy, who's the daughter of Franklin Graham, and she is here. We're going to talk about uh, Israel. We're going to talk about pre, what do you say, prepartum or pregnancy, mm -hmm. depression and anxiety. We're going to talk about these revivals, what's going on at the colleges. And I also want to tell you how, because of your grandfather, my whole family became a Christian. Oh, I look which, that. Okay, so my grandma went to SMU when she was 15. And that Southern Mount, <laughs> Southern Methodist University, I think it's Swibbits. Uh, and she kept getting invited to First Dallas, to First Baptist Dallas. And she did not want to go. She was like, I don't want to go there. She just like, for whatever reason, did not want to go. And so her friends were like, well, if you're not going to go there, will you come to this Billy Graham crusade? She was 15. And she went and she got saved. And he announced at the end that he would be at First Baptist Dallas that Sunday. And so even though she didn't want anything to do with our church or come to our church, she just really loved Billy Graham. So whenever she went and visited, um, at the end, he preached. And at the end, he joined the church. And my grandma said, well, if it's good enough for Billy Graham, it's good enough for me. And so that's how we ended at First Baptist Dallas. Uh -huh. And my grandma was the matriarch. And that's how my dad was saved. And my dad witnessed to my mom. Of course, they witnessed to me. I was witness to my husband. And it just goes on and on. And it really is. My dad one Sunday did the lineage, basically, like we all have a faith lineage. And so many 
of ours are traced back to your grandfather. So no pressure. Um, but what can you just tell us what it's been like to be in this family? <laughs> Well, I'm used to it, uh, you know, granddaughter, then the daughter. And then I actually married an NFL player. So then I went to being Corey's wife. And now you got kids. You know how it goes. You're then you become Margaret Austin and George's mom. So um, I don't mind all those titles. I love I love those titles. And it's an honor. I think as a teenager, I probably struggled as you're starting to find your identity and uh, stretch out your wings a little bit. I did struggle with that and with ministry and a family called to ministry. There was difficult things that I really kind of fought against. But as far as being a grand, I'm so thankful that I had grandparents and parents, the ones that you saw in public were the ones that we had at home. And my grandfather was always just so gracious um, and tender and loving. And it was always in my grandmother um, at home. And so they were just, that was them when they walked in, when you walked into that room, you were like the only person in that room. The eyes locked in onto you. They were so excited to see you. And I'm thankful for that. I, you know, I just don't know anything different when you grow up under that umbrella. But um, I'm just, as the older you get, you're probably the same. You're so thankful for a godly legacy. I read something recently because it was talking to them about this very thing. Like, well, what about people who don't have a godly legacy? Like their parents weren't Christians. Their grandparents aren't Christians. They're the first people to kind of go to church. And it was really interesting. It talked about, I, th I forget what book it was, but it talked about how as Christians, because we become part of God's family, that we can claim still a legacy mm -hmm. of faith. Like we can still say, well, in my lineage is David or Abraham mm -hmm. or Ruth. And that was really cool to me because I, I have many friends and family members that don't have this great legacy. Maybe they even have one they're embarrassed of. But when we become Christians and we're children of God, we can claim a different legacy. And I've, I've just never heard that before. I thought that was so good because, I mean, it is hard if you're the only Christian or really feel like you don't necessarily have the pedigree that other people but I think, have. Like what an honor, you know, that God did, God chose you and yeah. that legacy begins with you. Uh, to change the ways and that what an honor it is and just God's goodness of, you know, and two, our families can be those who have influence on us. Sometimes those can be dear friends or dear mentors in us that lead us and guide us in those kind of things. And, um, you know, my prayer is that I can at least do it for my children that I don't mess up. <laughs> okay. So this is fun. And I remember whenever I heard the story. My dad told me this story and I wondered if it would end up in the crown, which it did. So if you don't know what the crown is, it's one of the most famous shows on TV right now. And it's about Queen Elizabeth and how just her life. But the connection is they have a whole episode on when Billy Graham goes to meet with the queen at her request. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So when my grandfather uh, went over to do uh, some crusades over there in meetings, he um, he wasn't like welcomed a lot with open arms. I mean, there was a lot of criticism. Um, even just recently, I was in Europe over the fall and um, was in line and talking to these people from London. And they go, oh, yeah, we had heard of they didn't know I was Billy Graham's granddaughter. They were asking what we we're doing there. And I said, well, I work for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. We're here with Frank Graham. They had no idea who I was. But when I said Billy Graham, they just kind of laughed. And they kind of like that American evangelistic, that that yeah. kind of um, persona. Silly. So that that's mm -hmm. what they kind of viewed him as. But she, she um, was probably just intrigued and wanted to speak, invited him to come meet with her. And what I loved about my grandfather is that he always kept those meetings. He kind of learned the hard way from earlier in his life. But from then on, he kept those meetings very private. What was the conversations they had? What were the prayer and stuff? They kept those uh, private. He kept those conversations private. And um, that I've learned, you know, as Christians, sometimes we can kind of flaunt our relationship and the we have with other people. And um, he kept that private, but it was uh, definitely a sweet um, respect and relationship through the years. Okay. So you recently went to Israel. So did I. And 
you know, we have a different understanding. Probably it's been explained to us pretty well why Christians are supposed to be pro-Israel. Can you explain that, where that idea comes from? Yeah, so we get that question a lot. And sadly, it's because the churches have neglected to teach that and why that relationship is so important. Uh, right after October 7th, that weekend, I was in a church and there wasn't one mention of Israel from the pulpit. And the following weekend, I was visiting at a different church, which would be a, a younger demographic of a church. And once again, not one mention, not one prayer on behalf of Israel. And I was just shocked. I, I watched these families, these American families who you just are so privileged to live in freedom and they have mm -hmm. no idea what's going on halfway around the world. So as Christians, you know, I personally look at it and there's so many pastors and theologians could give a way more better answer. But for me personally, it comes down to God promised in scripture in Genesis, this land to Abraham and mm -hmm. to Israel. The, and actually it was a much larger piece of land than what they are in today of current right. Israel, mm -hmm. what we know. But I look at it as this, this is God's plan. Why did he choose them? It wasn't because they were the mightiest and might. It wasn't because they were a perfect group of people. No, they were flawed. They were, but he picked them because he loved them. And he used Israel through this land and through the people to bring his son, the Messiah, the savior of the world. And I was just reading in Zechariah 14, the day of the Lord. Um, and I was reading this morning and it said for, um, and I'll just skim over it for, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. And it says, and the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem um, on the east, and the Mount of Olives should be split in two. And the Lord's kingdom is going to be established visibly here in, our, in Jerusalem. He is coming back to this land. This is why it's such a conflict. And in scripture, God says, I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. And I believe that's why we have been blessed beyond imagination is because our friendship with Israel and the United States but we do know all nations will come against Israel one day. And we, this is where Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom, that we worship a Jewish Messiah and that we are to be a friend of Israel and to the Jewish people. For me personally, Israel changed my life. It, you're talking about the legacy of your family. That was where the trajectory of my family changed. On the Mount of okay. Olives at the hotel on top of it, your dad would know it used to be the Intercontinental that's where my dad in his early 20s got down on his knees and finally surrendered his life to Christ after he had been running and running. And mm -hmm. so for me, he went the next day. Um, my mom was not a believer. He had been dating, but they broke up. The next day, he went to a local jewelry store, bought the ring that I wear today, and went home and proposed to my mom. And then two months, a, a few weeks later, my grandmother, Ruth Graham, led my mom to Christ. So for me personally, that's where my legacy and trajectory of my life changed. So... Um, Israel, you've probably been there. I've actually been there with your dad, I believe, uh, years ago, but, um, it, when you see the scripture and when you see where the scripture took place and where, um, the Jewish people wrote the scriptures that we study, it changes your life. You know, it's amazing to see Israel. A lot of people won't get to see Israel. What what else do you think is an important, like, milestone or spiritual, like, journey if someone can't make it to Israel? Is there something else they can do to experience God in a new way? Oh, well, I mean, if we're talking about Israel, we have, thankfully, we have so many great resources and mm -hmm. pastors yeah. who have, does study in there. And I would just encourage... Um, to really study the Old Testament, I think we have a lot of churches mm -hmm. that neglect the Old Testament. And it's mm -hmm. so important because we see the bloodline through the Old Testament of God's plan of redemption yeah. for the human race. And it was through his son and through Israel to bring us Jesus. And mm -hmm. um, God, you, you don't have to go to Israel to have your life change. Yeah. God will use wherever yeah. you are. Um, but I do encourage if you ever have an opportunity to go, to go to Israel. Yeah. Um, it's definitely should be everybody, you know, wants to go to Europe or go to Asia and all these things. I always say put Israel on top of the list. That's great. OK, so we talked about um, before this a little bit about how do you describe you say pre-pregnancy, 
depression? Oh, or it how has are a name, you? but I just, most okay. people always talk about postpartum. I just kind of say, yeah, the prepartum uh, depression and all three of my pregnancies. So what is that? Um, well, I struggled in all of mine. Well, the first one, I wouldn't have had any idea. It was just all of a sudden, I was this outgoing person my whole life, um, always kind of the extrovert. And all of a sudden with my first pregnancy, it just, something came over me. It was just like this really dark, dark spirit. I didn't want to leave the house. Um, anxiety and stress for the first time and depression. So I, of course I experienced it with my second one. Um, but my third one, um, for those probably don't know my story, I, I've shared it, um, openly after I had the baby, but with the third one, she kind of came later in my life. My other two children are a little bit older and just with different current events going on in my own personal life it was really heightened the depression and anxiety. And I really struggled. Um, it was a dark time in my, I was just angry with the Lord. I had a lot of questions for the Lord. Um, and things you couldn't explain because it was a, it was a dark, dark spear over me. Thankfully, every time when the baby's placed in my arms in the hospital, it like goes away. Oh, thank But on goodness. the way to the hospital, I am crying and screaming all three times. I tell my husband, I don't want a baby. I don't want a baby. Um, I, he probably thinks I'm a lunatic. What's going on? Yeah. But for me, it was, you know, we're going to go through dark times and really dark storms. For me, I haven't even shared the darkest of the dark. I do think we as Christian leaders, we can be open about some of our struggles, but also there's some things we're, we should keep private. It was a dark time for me. And yeah. I, I don't even want to share those darkest moments, but for people mm. to be reminded that God is faithful and he's good. And there are many mm -hmm. times in our life that we don't feel like opening up our Bible, that we mm -hmm. don't feel like praying and we have to do it out mm -hmm. of obedience. Your heart's not always, it's not based on an emotion, but it's based on the act of obedience that we are called to be obedient to the Lord. So I would have to open up my Bible in those days and just read. And I didn't feel anything. I'll be honest. Or I would have to turn on the worship music and I would turn on old hymns and just sing, even when my heart didn't feel like singing. And God is so faithful. The scripture says, you draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And he did. He would have eventually, as soon as that baby was placed in my arms, my little girl, his presence was so ever close. But he took me through that, that valley to understand some different things in my life and what other women might struggle through. How do you know if you're sharing too much? There's sometimes, I think, especially in the Christian world and in women's ministry, you, you, they got to write the next book. <laughs> it comes down to a book down. And I'm not trying to be critical because like, who am I? You know, the Lord might be late. No, I, I literally was watching a comedian and they said the way that they came up with their next act, they didn't have any material. So they started thinking about all their secrets. There are some things we can, we need to be authentic and we need to be real with the world. We're all struggling to go through dark, but I look at my grandparents as an example. And, um, they were open. My grandmother would be open about prodigal children and, her struggle with that. She never acted anything different. She was very open and used that because God will use those things for us to minister to other people. Right. So that's just one of my own personal opinions. I think we need, there's a balance and we live in a social media world where we think everything needs to be out there. And that if we share something so crazy and so um, shocking to our base, that'll get us more followers, more likes, it'll get us the next thing. And so it's just be wise in what you share. We are to be true and sh tell the world what God's done in through our own lives. Um, but do it with maybe a little bit of wisdom and grace. <laughs> I just know a lot of people that listen to this show because I'm a therapist, like there's a lot of psychology minded people listening. I know that they would have a question about what you meant by dark spirit. For me, it was supernatural. And I okay. think it was, of course, just um, Satan. And when I talk about a dark spirit, it, it was it was not sissy. It was not the sissy that people knew. Okay. Um, I could not reason. I couldn't think. It was complete darkness in my spirit for about nine months. And okay. I was so embarrassed and so ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to realize that we're going to go through lonely times. I think even if I had shared it, I did share it with some people and even some of the closest but they're not going to be there on the moments that you need them. And they're not going to be able to call you when you're sitting in a fetal position because they don't know you are. Like, they're not calling you at the moment. The, the Lord has us go through lonely times. And it's okay to be lonely at times because he's going to pull you through and realize I was there with you.
The only thing, just as a disclaimer, is if it gets into suicidal thoughts, you need to tell someone. Yes, so you're course. not supposed to do that on your own because it can, that's just can be too much. What did your husband do to help you or to help stay encouraged? He was working, we, he works for Samaritan's Purse and we both do it in, um, in Alaska in the summer times. So he was working and he was gone for about five months of those nine months. Then we had a hurricane that came through and destroyed our whole town. So it when I was uh, seven, eight months pregnant. So it was a little bit of oh a wild gosh. time. But for my husband, you know what? I He is the jack of all trades, can do anything. He's currently out putting a roof on a house right now for one of our, for one of our rental properties. But so he can do a lot of things. Um, but I will say he probably sat there and looked at me like, she's crazy. Something has happened to my (laughs) wife. What happened to her? He's not a sit down. Let's talk about our emotions kind of guy, which is okay. I think sometimes us women think we need a a spouse like that, that it's going to sit down with our feelings. And a lot of men are just not wired that way. They're, um, that's not how their brain works. My (laughs) husband wants to like see the problem, solve the problem. And that's his spirit. So for me, I just, he was very kind. He understood where I was, um, especially with the third one, because we'd walked through it twice and he didn't put a lot of pressure on me. Poor guy. I don't think I allowed him to join because he was so excited. He had wanted a baby for like five years. And so it's a really crazy story. I, we had made a bet one day. I lost that bet. And nine months later, here came a baby. And Wait, so he won the what bet. now? No, does this go under where you don't share everything? No, you no, no. no. I, I've shared it on bet. my podcast. My husband had asked for a baby for five years and okay. I was just busy with life and with work and life just kind of happened. We sold our big home. I live in 900 square feet. I'm recording for my home and it's 900 square feet right now. And life just happened. So I just like, no, I think, I think we're done with two. And I had wanted a big family, but time just happened. And he mm-hmm. kept asking and asking, and it kind of was over my head, like, Lord, I don't want him to resent me as we go older in life. Do we have another one? And, um, but there was nothing in me. I didn't want to walk through that depression again. I didn't want to go through any of that. I travel for work. Um, my work requires me to travel. And so I tell, we made a bet in a bar. I don't even, he and I both don't drink alcohol, but we were ax throwing for a friend's birthday. And I said, I beat him one of the rounds. And I said, if I beat you, you never ask me again for a baby. And if you win, <laughs> we'll try. And so I lost and I said, double or nothing, one month, two months. And I lost again. So here it came nine months later and I lost that bet. And so the Lord will teach you, don't make bets in a bar. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that that's somewhere in the Old Testament. But he, My mm-hmm. husband was so excited and poor guy, I didn't let him um, cele- celebrate that too much. But we are now. We celebrate yeah. now. A lot of people do not talk about postpartum or pre-baby emotions, especially if they're Christians, because children are a gift from the Lord, right? And then it kind of... You can feel bad for people that like can have kids or does they don't want kids. And it can seem kind of like unholy to have problems during it. Something that no one told me. I was pregnant with six kids. Yeah, six kids in a year. And the first three miscarriages and the triplet pregnancy, even if you don't carry the baby full term, mm. even having a miscarriage, you still have all the pregnancy hormones. And so you still go through mm-hmm. postpartum and all of that coming out of your system as if you had a baby. And a lot of people don't realize that. So they're getting pregnant again and then miscarrying and then again, mm. and it really can mm-hmm. mess you up. And so I was doing that and then got pregnant with the triplets, which of course was amazing. <laughs> But that was a lot of hormones. And I'm just saying this to say, you can love the Lord, be solely devoted, the best Christian ever, and still have a very hard time while you're pregnant or after you're pregnant. So don't be afraid to tell anyone that. Okay, I want to ask you real quick as we're wrapping up, uh, revivals. That's the, that seems to be happening again with different colleges. And, you know, Billy Graham preached during the Jesus movement. That's how so many people got saved. Mm. Uh, what are, what would you say about revivals? Like, what, how should we think about them at churches or in colleges? Oh, I think it's exciting to see what's going on and we need to be encouraged by it. I think we have a generation that, um, is really seeking. And we need to remember too, as I said in the beginning, when it comes 
to revivals and the Holy Spirit working in ways is that when the gospel, the gospel needs to be simple. We try to make it so complicated and it needs to, and and that's what I've learned from my grandfather and my dad is, um, you know, they were evangelists. They weren't pastors. Your, your dad's a pastor. He's teaching the scripture. And for my grandfather, he was an evangelist that kept it simple. And he was invited, um, uh, I believe this time it was in Oxford. And he, my grandfather was a little bit intimidated with the big theologians and all that going on. And he was trying to be like, speak these lofty words and all this stuff. And he realized when he got back to his hotel room, like, why is nobody responding? And he said, the Lord just reminded him, keep them simple of what I've called you to do. Yeah. And I think that's how we need to live our life. If we want to see revival, that people need to hear the gospel. And the gospel is so simple. Yeah. Uh, you know, that God sent his son, Jesus, and Jesus died on the cross, took our sins, shed his blood for you and for me, and three days later conquered the grave. That's A right. young generation, they need it. They want to hear it and they want to see it. Um, I think they have a a hard time trusting people and that gospel right there. It's not in your nice creative words. It's not in some, some fancy concert that's going to go on with fog machines. Those are all great tools to get people there. That's awesome. I'm not criticizing that, but the thing that will change somebody's life, there's power in the gospel and we can't neglect that. We need to keep it simple when we're looking at these revivals. It's so exciting from um, what we're seeing on college campuses to Greg Laurie's movie, Jesus revolution, what's going on. Um, man, we can't think that it's too hopeless. When I listen to my grandfather on Sirius XM to this day, you would think he's talking today's time. Nothing's new under the sun. Yeah. The gospel has not changed. And it's the same gospel that will change people's lives. I know. I just did an altar call at our girls event. We had like a thousand girls there. And there's something that makes you kind of scared. Like, you're like, you're like, oh, I hope I'm going to say this right. I'm going to use the right analogy. And then God's like, Juliet, come on. <laughs> so like just you're right. I've been there. I've been there. I know. And you're like, wait, I should have come up with this. Like, you know, I've great been there. I background. think I'm, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not my grandfather. I'm not my dad. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. these but women it doesn't, need something but different. I know exactly. But it's like the, this is the truth and it's the truth of the gospel and it's real. It's not your opinion. So anyway, went ahead and presented and have lots of girls get saved, but there, uh, that can even happen in our daily lives. Like, Oh, I don't know the right like way to bring this up, or I don't know the right analogy or the right verse. Well, we can know the right verses, but <laughs> you know, people just get kind of scared. And I say that cause I I've from experience, there's been times I've been scared and nervous. Even the last time I was doing an event, I'm like, do I, do I do an altar call? Do I not? It's a women's yeah. event. Maybe we don't need that. You know, like Satan just works. So I say that as an encouragement to others, been there, done that. I have failed. I got to, it's a constant reminder of myself that that's what our world needs. And yes, that's what, and it's real and it's true. And it really works. Okay. So Susie, how can our listeners stay connected to you? Oh, thanks for having me today. Um, I have a podcast called fearless, a fearless faith in a compromising culture, um, social media and, um, my website, sissygramlynch.com. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on here. Thank you for listening to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts.